I'm recording, by the way. So this is, we are live. Well, I'm not live. Today is the 26th of December, 2021. The day after Christmas. Of course, I figured I better do something near Christmas. That's why I didn't do any recording for last week. Because I wanted to create something a little different. So I have my brother here and then my niece. They might contribute something to today's show. It's a little different. And of course, Christmas or the holidays are about family. So I am doing it. First of all, my name is Stroda Aglago. I'm the host of Love, Forgive, Live podcast. Thank you for joining me. And then, of course, I'm excited because I have my family here, part of my family here, to join me for today's uh, show. Today's topic is very important to me because when is the topic not important to me? This topic is actually very important because it has a lot to do with the holiday. The holiday is especially stressful for a lot of people. I recognize the reason why is because a lot of times they have memories of their loved ones that are past and they're always remembering that, especially around the holidays. And people kind of wonder that the family member is not there to enjoy the moment with them. And the last time they had a family member there, the fun they had they can't have the same thing anymore so of course the past keeps coming in today we are going to talk about what happens the drawbacks the feelings the thoughts and how to deal with it i'll give some pointers about how to deal with it how to manage the emotions that are coming up and of course what to do when you're feeling overwhelmed how to pull yourself back into the now and not allow the past to drive you into a place of darkness and this happens to a lot of people especially with my line of work i see a lot of clients who will come and overwrought with emotion because the holidays are so stressful for them and honestly by the time the holidays are over people are exhausted and they're feeling spent so it's very important for us to recognize hey it's time to talk about this and i will give some pointers give some information and ideas and tips and of course i'm going to be asking my brother jiwanu conroy obey and be able to understand some of the emotional angst and of course my niece will also give her pointers about what kids are feeling about the stressors that goes on with the holiday all right okay great my name is uh, Conroy Jiwanu Obi. Um, my sister is Shroda Eglaku. And we have my daughter here, Nayana. Hi. She's joining us. Yes. And um, today, uh, my sister and I, we'd like to speak about the holiday stresses and uh, there's lots of good things to talk about, too, during the holiday season. Yes. But uh, a lot of people are in need uh, to hear some some ways in which they can uh, handle the, emotional all the emotions regulations. Yeah. that come up with everything. The, the emotional regulations that have memories attached to the holidays. Because people tend to have so many angst about it. And I've heard from so many people. Seriously. Yeah. And... It's sad because it's hard when people feel they're not um, able to get into the holiday spirit. We see this on TV, on social media. Everybody's like excited. Oh, it's the holidays, holidays. But there's a lot of stress that goes on with it. And every holiday is packed with emotions of past. And especially the other thing that I've recognized is when relatives, extended relatives are coming together together. With other family members. Yes. They stress about even things in their past. Or something that was done throughout the year. That they're, they've been upset about but not able to address. And then it's like, 
Holy. And I'm not going to say that word. <laughs> They're going to. Holy. Macro. They are going to be in the same room with that person that they're holding a grudge about. They're holding this about or this. It's like the holiday is just packed with a lot of emotional stuff. And it's really stressful. And so, like I said, I will talk about the emotional regulation and some tips on what to do, how to manage. And of course, I will ask my brother some questions about how do you know that your emotions are not being regulated? Can we start by giving some examples? Examples. Can I give an example and then we can go through. Oh, by the way, people, my sister is, uh, my sister, sorry. (laughs) uh, She's a registered therapist. um, So she has her master's in therapy and psychology. So, yes. Yes. I just want to make sure you guys know that (laughs) because she has some really good teachings available here. Um, For me, I I just seem to um, have good critical thinking skills and. Uh, some a small bit of wisdom from my own life, and my daughter here, she's very intelligent. Yes, and she has okay, a great so, insight. Okay, uh, so we'd like to. I'd like to come up with an example, and then my sister will kind of guide me through how to deal with that, and I'll give some feedback as well. All right. So, um, a typical example of uh, you know holiday stress can be um, you have family members. That you haven't seen for a long time. Yes. And you may have some unhealed trauma or unhealed, you know, arguments that happened like five, ten years ago. And you haven't really solved it. hmm And then, uh, you know, every year you're able to kind of just like avoid these people or pretend like, you know, you don't feel those emotions. But this is a high stress year because of COVID. And there's a lot of things going on. Mm-hmm. So maybe this year, you know, your family comes over. And you can no longer hide your distaste or your anger or yes. whatever it is. <laughs> and so then you're like, uh, you know, you're trying your best to be distant. But then you find yourself having anxiety about it, you know. And then this person, maybe they see you having anxiety. And so they come closer to you all the time. and want to know what's wrong. And, uh, you know, you're struggling with, do I respect my own emotions? Mm-hmm. Or do I play nice for everybody else? And suppress my emotions. You know, those are kind of the options that I've been involved with. Not this year, but years in the past. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so as a therapist, that particular example, how would I go about addressing that? First of all, I always try to make my clients, and even when I'm coaching someone or just friends, when someone approaches me with that type of topic or situation that they're dealing with because their anxiety about things that are coming up with them with the holidays. And of course, dealing with when they're having the anxiety or the, the difficulty managing their emotion or regulating their emotion. And then they have someone who might pick up on it and then start going, what's wrong? What's wrong? Tell me, here's a fact. Number one, that individual is having that anxiety At that moment, because they probably are not aware of where the emotions is coming from. They don't have the language to be able to name it and say, this is exactly what is going on. Or I know exactly. And of course, I always tell clients, allow yourself to go through that emotion. But then take the time to not blame yourself and beat yourself over it. And start going like, I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm so this. And here's the thing. You are your worst critic. You beat yourself more. And then blame yourself for not being able to access the language. Mm. And be able to say, this is exactly what is wrong with me or what is going on with me. I want to address this A, B, C, and D. And I know what to do. It's okay if you don't know what to do. Allow yourself to go through the emotion. Allow yourself to not know what to do. And of course, allow yourself to know that it is okay to not have the answers. And then do this few steps. One, you can remove yourself from the crowd. Go to a a private space. Do your deep breathing. Do your meditation. 
whatever coping skills that you've learned through therapy or other, otherwise, even if you're not going to therapy or coaching, do what you have available for you. You're to go into your tool bag and pick out what you need to do your debriefing or your calm. When you are able to do that, then ask this question. And sometimes it's a really good idea to ask these questions. There are three questions I'm going to give you. One, what happened before I started having these emotions? Number two, did I speak to someone that, that triggered this? Number three, right now, as this is happening, what can I do to regulate my own emotion right now on my own? before I get help. Answer these questions for yourself. After you answer these questions, what is going to happen is going to give you some sort of a clarity and a window into where this is coming from. Then you can best address that. Then if you can reach for help, ask for that help. Because now when you're going for help, you have an answer as to what help you need. Because here's the thing. Can I interject? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, um, for instance, so I just want to touch on, on two of the topics you brought up. Yeah. So, uh, some deep breathing exercises. Uh, Naomi, you want to join me so I can show these people kind of what we do? To calm down? Sure. Okay. So, uh, I learned this from my therapist a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. And I actually practiced this uh, prior to doing business meetings or any high stressful situations. So... What I do is you take a deep breath in through your nose and you push your stomach out. And that allows you to get the air deep inside your lungs. And so I think right now we should do a little practice uh, because I do it with my daughter when we want to relax, things like that. So what you do is you inhale through the nose and you count to four. And then you hold your breath for two seconds. And as you exhale, you control your breathing out and you count to four. And you continue this process till you get to number five. And by then, all of a sudden, you're feeling like this, you're shallow breathing, all of a sudden your shoulders drop. And you continue to do it for up to ten times, and you'll be amazed on how clear your thinking becomes. So I can give you an example of how I do it. You want to do it with me, Nana? Okay. Okay. So, So, one of the most important things is take the deep breath. So I won't do all five, but that's what I do basically. And it takes like maybe a day to learn how to do it properly. And you'll start to see what happens is when you get in high stress situations, you can just excuse yourself to a washroom, practice this. I would suggest, I would suggest not, uh, you know, staring in the mirror, watching yourself, try to calm down because sometimes that can make your mind go into <laughs> other places. Yes. <laughs> so... And that's just one technique to do. And um, another thing is my sister was mentioning, you know, um, reach out to someone for help. You know, we all have that one friend that is a really good friend and here to listen to us, whether it's a relative or a friend or, you know, close confidant. Um, if you're really feeling like that high anxiety, give them a shout. Mm-hmm. And practice with them prior to these events that when you call them in these states... Their job is to calm you down mm-hmm. by acknowledging what fears are actually logical. So whatever fears that are creating this massive anxiety, mm-hmm. you know, they're going to talk you down mm-hmm. because you need someone who's thinking logically. And they're going to be like, hey, that's not a real fear. You need to calm down and relax. And then they're going to bring things down for you. Yes. And so that's one way you can reach out to somebody is you they're going to calm you down. That's very important. Yes. No. Have you tried that before? Yeah, in the beginning of the fight. And then when you tried it, what did you get out of it? Mainly, like, um, like, like calm it down and like focus on like what's actually happening. That's right. Yes. And that's very important because it's not only happening to one person. 
the chances are that person that you're contacting has already either seen you go through that before or has been um, able to go through that themselves. And you've had a discussion with them to let them know that you will be reaching out to them. And that's very important to use your tools, reach out, contact the person and say, hey, I need help. And then they've seen it before. They have know they know how it's like and what is going on and who has been through this with you. Yes. Looking for your support system and reaching out for them, there's no shame in it. There's no shame in it because it's what you need to deal with what you're going through. Because when anxiety and the fear and the emotion is coming at you, a lot of the time I've seen it where the individual is not able to access what they know. So if they can call someone, that person can remind them what they've done before and what worked and what is possible. I hope that makes that is clear and that makes sense. Yes. Now, do you want to continue to do like... The same way, do some examples of what people might be going through? I think that would be a good idea. Okay, great. And by the way, sis, I love you very much. I love you too. So here's the thing. The other part of all this is when dealing with lost uh, past, our families that have been lost over the years or in this year or the year a, a few years before, here's the thing with, the, with grief. People think, oh, you know, that was 10 years ago. That was five years ago. That was six years ago. They should be over and done with. Grief is not something that has a timetable. Grief does not have a timetable because grief is something people experience differently. Everybody experiences grief differently. And if they've lost a loved one before, let me put this straight. It's not something like they're going to snap their fingers and say, it's okay. And I I get so like upset when I hear people say, oh, well, get over it. It's been 10 years. They should move on by now. It's not true. Maybe to the individual who is saying that, that's what they've experienced before. But here's the thing. Most people, every holiday, it brings back the memory of that person they've lost. When, because... Your lost ones and your loved lost ones would always be with you. So every holiday, the memories come up. So you can share with me as an example, and then we can yes. address it. Okay. Uh, this is a real-life example for myself. Um, so um, anyone who knows me and knows my, my life, especially my Native family, is uh, for about 11 years, <clears throat> maybe more, um, we've been losing family members you know, sometimes two people a year, and majority one person a year. Um, and these are people I grew up with. Mm -hmm. I really care about. I really love. Mm -hmm. And when Christmas time comes around, I start reminiscing about all the laughing and the fun times. Mm -hmm. And while this is happening, I'm really feeling like, oh, you know, I, I really miss this person. And then reality slaps me in the face. Yes. This person is no longer on this earth. And I start to feel down. Mm -hmm. And then I start to feel guilty for being happy. Mm -hmm. Thinking that, you know, this. And so I find myself reliving the memories of loved ones in a happy way. But then after the happiness comes the sorrow. And so as a therapist, how do you suggest we um, deal with those as they come up? Well, I'm glad you asked that. You brought that example up. It's actually something I had discussed in a, a, YouTube, a TikTok video, a three-minute TikTok video on specifically that. Here's what. Because the emotion starts coming up, you start reminiscing about the person. You start remembering all that stuff. Sometimes it's fun. And then you smile. And then you it pulls you back into survivor guilt. That survivor's guilt is awful. Because it starts to remind you that crap. 
I'm feeling all this love and joy. The person is not here. What am I doing? But they're still not here. And that is a gut-wrenching feeling because it brings up so much. But then again, when that happened, it is very important to recognize that they left a legacy. They left a good legacy. And when you take that legacy and decide to choose the good from that and share it, with others, the joy, the good memory, and the impact, they, the good impact they made in your life. Because guess what? I always say this to clients. The death was horrible because the person is gone. They're no longer here. But that was not 90% of their entire life here on earth. The time they spent on earth here with you, putting love into you, the, the moments and the joys they place in you, the lessons, all that, remember that. Share it, with, especially if you have young ones. Share it with them. Bring the laughter. And what's going to happen is when they start talking about the stories and the joy, it brings you into the, the present. Because anytime that feeling as, oh no, I'm feeling this way and I'm remembering them and I'm being happy. What starts happening is that You start living for this moment, for the present. And when you start living for the present, something beautiful happens. It takes you completely, completely by surprise. You find yourself being more joyful, having more laughter. And that fear or worry that the person is no longer here because we cannot undo it. And bring the person here physically. But you can live that good memory now. By watching what you do in the present. So when it pulls you back in the present. You end up enjoying that joy. And that is the most important thing. The presence. Yes, I agree. Um, So one of the ways that I dealt with it is. Yes, finding present. And. Uh, I do this thing, and sometimes my family probably looks at me like I'm a bit weird when I do this. <laughs> is, uh, you know, while we're, you know, really enjoying ourselves during a family event, all of a sudden I'll just sit there and I'll close my eyes and I'll just record the feelings and the emotions I'm feeling, which are happiness, calmness, mm-hmm. and I'll record the sounds. Yes. And I'll just really be present with the moment. Because like, I feel like when my kids are laughing or when my auntie is talking to me and I see a smile on her face or I hear my sisters laugh mm-hmm. or my dad, you know, he's telling me stories. You know, these are things, memories I want to hold on to. Mm-hmm. And so I relax myself. Excuse me. And then I decide that I'm going to record this moment. Not only what I'm seeing, not only what I'm hearing, but what I'm feeling. And that really helps me to stay present and enjoy the people around me and the things around me. Yes. And then when something stressful comes my way, it's easier for me to just be like, uh, you know what, I'm not going to go down that path right now. <laughs> so, yeah, that's kind of how I handle that. And I think that's great. The other thing that I forgot to mention is that If you have uh, a funny story about the individual, that's the time to share it with the loved ones. Talk about it. Um, Bring up. And then the best part is engage other people to become helpers of your memory. Because when, especially if you have someone who knew the person at the time too, when you start speaking about the story, I do that sometimes too. I would leave a little detail, kind of a bit not so sure of the details being correct. So then I enlisted another person to help fill in the blank. So what happens is you immediately create storytelling with the individuals present and allow that story about that the ones that have passed to become a part of the moment 
a part of the presence, a part of now, and recreate that. And sometimes it may not be accurate, but the joy that comes from that and the excitement and the laughter is priceless. Yes. Now, um, is there anybody who's watching who would like to give us uh, you know, something they might be struggling with mm-hmm. and, and how like I can give my opinion on it and my sister can give her, her clinical advice? Oh, Lord. <laughs> which is very good. Yes. <laughs> Uh, well, anyone who wants us to know, the comments are open in the live yes. um, program on Instagram. Let us know, and then we will definitely, I will address it, my brother will address it, and I will, I will also uh, chime in on it and, and talk about it, so that's not a problem. Yeah. One thing I will also ask you is this. When you manage um, the motions... And then you realize, okay, now you're finally in the groove of working through the emotions. And now you're like, okay, I'm present. I'm good. I'll be bringing up the stories, anything that come up, bring back the good stories, the fun stories. And then remember that. Yes. And then you notice another person that had nearly the same experience, like your brother or Mm -hmm. another relative. But then they're kind of getting away from the rest of you. And not engage it. You can notice that they're detaching from the whole situation. How do you reach them? <clears throat> well, what I've learned is um, it's different for men and women. Mm-hmm. So for men, um, when we start detaching, it's because we're feeling weak and we're feeling vulnerable. Mm-hmm. And we start to think people can see that on us. Or we start mm-hmm. to think, I'm feeling really angry. I, I might yell at someone right now, so I need to get out of this situation. Mm -hmm. And so we start to detach. (laughs) And honestly, the last thing we want (laughs) is for another man our age to come up and be like, what's wrong, bro? You know, (laughs) you can put your your shoulder on my, uh, you can put your head on my shoulder and cry it out, bro. You know? And then um, what I realized is I just walk up to someone, say, how you feeling? You know? Try to do a little bit of small talk. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, instead of just coming out and be like, hey, I noticed you look like you're vulnerable right now. You know? You just start with some small talk. And a lot of times we'll start speaking. The number one thing is what I've learned to do is I just listen. I don't compare my own life situations to theirs. Mm -hmm. I just listen. And to avoid myself from getting stuck in what is called a drama triangle, Mm -hmm. um, I've developed a technique of my own. I'll ask them, is it okay if I give you some advice? Don't feel pressured. If you don't want to hear anything, that's fine. Yes. But is it okay with me? Now, if they just stay quiet, you stay quiet. Don't keep asking. Because now you're pushing them. Yes. If they say, yes, I would like some advice. This way, they're going to allow you to speak to them because they've given you their permission. Mm-hmm. Um, with women, I find, because I have, majority of my family is females. So I find, I just straight up ask the question, like, are you okay? Like, how are you feeling? Mm-hmm. You know? And sometimes they're like, I'm all right. I'm like, are you sure? Because you look pretty sad. And because most of my cousins who are girls... They trust me, they'll start to tell me. And um, I do my best just to listen Mm -hmm. and not to tell them, don't think like that, don't don't, uh, have these emotions. I just do my best to listen. And then I say the same thing, do you want my advice? And then I give it. And I try not to be judgmental. That's important. Something I'm working on myself, but it's really important when you're speaking to a woman. Try not to judge whatever she's saying. Even if it doesn't sound... Like the nicest thing. She just needs to get it out. Um, so we do have... There's a question here. One question. Mm-hmm. Do you want to say it out or do you want me to say it out? I'll say it out. Okay. Uh, how to cope with anger that comes with grieving. This is a really good one. That's very important. Uh, first of all, let me predicate this and say anger is not wrong. When you're angry during the grief, you have every right... And to give yourself the permission to feel that anger and the emotion. 
because guess what? It's part of the process and it's part of what you're dealing with. And your mind and your understanding is going to process that anyhow it comes to you. So please give yourself the permission to process that anger and know that it is okay. Don't get mad at yourself for being angry. Don't start belittling yourself for being angry. Don't say there's something wrong with me for being angry. Others may say that or come at you for that. But here's the thing. That is what you're feeling at that moment. It is nobody's business but what you're feeling. So give yourself that permission. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. Now, coping with it, there's so many things that you could do, but I only mention a few. Number one, create a space, a safe space for you to be angry. Number two, when you're angry, it's okay to tell yourself this is only but a moment. You may not understand how long it's going to take you or how far that anger is going to take you, but it's okay to allow yourself to believe it's a moment because guess what? Remember the past of other things that were so stressful, so scary, so demanding that you were angry about, that you were so angry and so enraged, you felt that anger would burn you. But here's the thing. That anger allows you to be able to quiet the storm a little bit. Because guess what? When the storm of the grief hits, sometimes, sometimes you need that anger. Though. It may sound to what I'm saying is like far out there, but you need that anger to allow you to at least feel something. Because guess what? Numbness is not an option. You got to feel. Can I jump in? Yes. Um, what my sister's talking about is very interesting. Because I had a big anger problem growing up. A lot of it came from grieving. Mm -hmm. And um, I realized, like, I used to feel ashamed mm. of allowing myself to feel anger. I used to feel weak because I felt like I should have better self-control. Mm-hmm. And as my sister was speaking and giving her um, her advice and, and you know her teachings, her wisdom, I realized, yeah, why do I suppress that? You know, and, and one thing I've been working on lately is I name it. So if I'm feeling that rage, feeling that anxiety of anger from grieving, I have to name it. Mm -hmm. So if I say to myself, <laughs> you know, and if you ever see me and I'm walking down the street, I'm like. Okay, Conroy, why are you feeling like this? I'm not crazy. I'm just naming and digging inside my own emotion. Mm -hmm. So I'll ask myself, okay, Conroy, you're feeling angry. What's underneath the surface of that? What's going on? Why are you so angry? And when I start to voice it and I tell myself the reasons why I know I'm angry, at first I'll try to lie to myself. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, no, that person didn't hurt me when they said that. And I'm like, oh, shit, yeah. What that person said really did hurt me. So once I start to name the reasons why I'm feeling the anger, then I'm giving myself the opportunity to start to work on it. Yes. And, um, yeah, and you can't name an anger if you won't even acknowledge that you're pissed. Yes. And, you know, and I think that's just one thing, and I just wanted to interject a little bit there. That's okay. Because I really found um, some value to what she was saying. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because too many people deny the emotions of anger. Yes. And they beat themselves and say, nah, 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 nah. I should just accept it. Why? Nobody said there had to be a script or a timetable as to how you deal with this emotion or with the loss or with the grief. It can take all kinds of shapes. Use it. And allow yourself to feel. Because when you run and don't feel, 
That's where the more you're literally building a mountain of pain. So once you start doing this, now you can access some things. And one of them is to your coping skills. Sometimes I tell my clients, go for a long walk. Don't put a time on it. And whilst you're walking, if you can speak to the person that you left, that left you through death, speak. And some people go, what? And I'm like, yes, you can. Because you're always here in your heart. Speak to them. Speak to what you wish you had said that you never said. Speak to that. Say it. Give yourself your voice. Give that grief a voice to speak. The reason why you're so angry. Speak. There's nobody there with you. If you cannot do that on your walk and do something like that, then it's time to write. And you know what? If the writing would come in a shape, I have a client that used to do this, to draw circles. Write the thing, the emotion that comes up, and then draw circles. And then go to the next one. Then draw circles. And then go to the next one and draw circles around the words. And all of a sudden, the person had a whole paper full of words with circles around it. So now... She has a clear understanding of what these emotions are that brought the anger up. Now she can name it. Now she can tackle each and every one of them. How am I feeling about this? Now it's time to do this. That's another way. Another person draws the emotion. Take a pencil and a book, a scrapbook, and draw that emotion. I have some individuals that will give each word different colors. And that helped them because they're able to explain how they're dealing with that and then move with a clear plan and understanding as to how to deal with it. And then after you're done with that, it is absolutely important to seek some type of either grief coaching, mental health, grief processing, and go through the grieving process, the steps, because it's heavy. You're not going to be able to do this by yourself. Ask for help. Ask for someone to help you manage this, ask for someone to help you become accountable to your own feelings. And that will give you something to work on because you become more present with what you're dealing with. Escaping it, numbing it, medicating it will not help you. It will just keep it dormant for a while but it'll still come up. I'd like to add one more thing. Sometimes we feel shame when we feel like we've done a lot of self-work so that we can be a better person. We've read a lot of books. Mm -hmm. We went to counseling for five years. And so we have this idea that we've read this many books or we went to this many uh, counseling sessions. We should be good. We're like graduates. It doesn't work like that because life just throws curveballs at us mm-hmm. all the time. Mm-hmm. And it's important that we realize, hey, this is just another curveball. I may not have been totally prepared for this. And there's nothing wrong that I can't handle the situation right now. Mm-hmm. You know, allowing yourself to feel vulnerable. And it doesn't mean you have to go and tell everyone around, hey, I'm feeling vulnerable. <laughs> <clears throat> it just means that acknowledging your vulnerabilities within yourself. Mm-hmm. And putting away the stubbornness and the pride will give you the opportunity to reach out. So for myself, um, I listen to a lot of books, uh, audiobooks. Uh, and every time I have a new problem in my life, I download a new book. And I realize that I have to listen. And then if that's not enough to kind of get me on track, I will go see a therapist. Yes. You know, 
I'm not too proud to be like, I'm too smart, I'm too strong. Mm-hmm. I'm just a human being. Mm-hmm. Every single human being, you know, requires some sort of help. Yes. So if you're in that state and you're used to always being the powerful one, especially if you're successful, mm-hmm. you don't want no anyone to know that you're feeling weak. You have to let yourself know. Yes. You know, and those that are closest to you mm-hmm. so that you can get the appropriate help that you need. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, anything else on grief I and agree. anger? I uh, agree. One thing I forgot to mention is this. When dealing with grief and anger and uh, allowing yourself to process it, when I said that you leave it dormant for a while and it'll come up, this is a fact. You can go and research this and read up on it. And this is where, what I'm going to say. When you decide to medicate your grief or put it aside and not deal with it, the strangest thing is it prolongs it and makes it worse for you. Listen to what I'm saying. It prolongs it because instead of giving in and to the processing and allowing it to be voiced, allowing it to get out, when you medicate, it's like putting a band-aid, a small band-aid on a bucket of a wound. I promise you, if you see a bucket size wound and you put a band-aid on it, it will soak the band-aid. It will bleed out and bury the band-aid. And when it buries the band-aid, it floods and gets worse. So it's very important because almost um, it's almost like you're choosing to stunt your own processing growth of the grief. I hope that makes sense. So when you do so, and it is time to process the grief, there's no more warning. It just shows up. And then people get shocked. Seven years, five years, they're like, but that, because you didn't deal with it. You medicated it. And pretend it wasn't happening. The moment you stop the medication, the moment you stop the things that you were using to numb it <coughs> so you don't feel it, do you know what happened? Here's what happens. It comes back and it's more painful. It's more painful because you remember it like it was yesterday because now you do not have the medication to numb it and make and pretend like it's not happening anymore. And that is extremely difficult to deal with. So then what happens is some people get fearful, go back into the medication again. Then it becomes a cycle. And now you're not dealing. By the time people are thinking, oh, now I should deal and stop medicating this, it's been 10, 20 years. And they have a serious mess on their hands. Um, I'd like to mention one thing, and uh, this is a bit of a touchy subject for some people, but I think it should be said. So during the state of grieving, um, if you're a single man or a single woman, um, you know, intimacy can be, you know, when we're intimate with someone, it releases chemicals in our brains, happy chemicals, and, uh, you know, it gives us that reprieve from the grief. But unfortunately, like any other drug, we can get addicted to that. And if we're running around chasing this uh, serotonin high, mm-hmm. and meanwhile, getting yourself stuck in relationships that are unhealthy for you. Mm-hmm. And also, getting yourself attracted to people that are going to abuse you mm-hmm. because they know that you're, um, you're weak right now. You're grieving. Mm-hmm. And so, really understanding your own self and how you're going to process relationships, especially mm-hmm. intimacy, mm-hmm. during your weak moments, that's going to be really crucial to your healing. Because if you're just getting more hurt mm-hmm. during your grieving process, it's going to be that much harder to get up. Not impossible to heal, you know, in any situation. There's some people that say that you cannot heal, you cannot do all these things in certain environments. You can do anything in any environment. Yes. It's just how hard is it going to be? That's the question. Yes. 
Okay, so uh, what's another holiday? <laughs> another one? holiday. Um, How will you give me an example? Sis? Well, I'll give you this example. I had someone who come, came to me years ago and said, you know, they were very upset about the loss of their son and how the holidays coming and she went to the store to buy something and she wished she wanted to buy something that mm -hmm. would be good for her son and she wanted to buy it so badly but she got so angry at the store and she was shaking and crying and she walked out of the store hating the store and she came home and she said she cried and stayed in bed for the rest of the day and so I asked, you know, so what made you reach out to come for a session? And she said, I realized that my son wouldn't want me to be in that state. And I said, well, I'm glad you're here. And then she said she wanted to know what else can she do when she was in the store with all this holiday cheer and buy this, buy this. She wanted to buy that so much for her son. And I said, you should have bought it. She's like, what? And I said, yeah, you should have bought it. That was very freeing for her. She's like, really? And I said, yes, buy it. And then go to a shelter. Go to a place where somebody might need it. Go to a, um, a homeless shelter. There could be a man or a young man there that would need that thing. And say, you know what? Give this to anyone who comes here who might need this. And I said, when you do that, you have used your son's memory and legacy to do something beautiful. And what is happening when you do that is that you pass on his name. You pass on his love. You pass on the joy and the, that care you have for your son. You remembered your son to do something that beautiful. There's nothing wrong with it. She's like... Oh, and I said, what is wrong with sharing the love that you have for your son with another human being? I'm not saying you're replacing him. You're not gonna, never going to replace him. But you're passing on that goodness, that joy. And she said, oh. And the other thing that sometimes people do, and I, we, we discuss, and she said, well, what, what else can I do to make his loss not be waste? And I asked her, well... Has she thought about maybe creating some sort of a, a scholarship program? She said, scholarship program. I said, this might be a lofty idea, but go to your local colleges and find out whatever your son studied in school and find out from that department anyone who is needing help for tuition or help to buy textbooks. You will buy the textbook for the one semester for that person. Pass on that. What that, hap what that does for you is that it makes you feel good that you're doing something for your son in his name. And she started beaming. The most beautiful part is that she sat down. I gave her 10 minutes and I said, you know what? This is your session. I'm giving you 10 minutes. You come up with what you want to do. She wrote, t t in 10 minutes, she had 10 things she could do to honor her son. And that was something that I didn't expect at all. And she walked out of there excited because she told me, I feel like now I have a purpose of what to do with my son's memory, with this stuff I'm feeling. I can do something. Because I want to do something for my son. And there's nothing more beautiful than that. So do simple things like that. Sometimes it's even buying a simple little toy. Or going to the ice cream parlor and buying the, <coughs> that <coughs> soft serve ice cream that your son may like. Or your daughter may like. Or your loved one or your grandma may like. And then be like, hey, just thought I'd just do something. I'm paying for the next person. One soft serve ice cream. My grandma used to love that. I just thought, you know, somebody would enjoy that. That makes you feel good. And it gives your heart a boost of joy. Yes. That's another way. Uh, I just read someone's comment. 
uh, about a real change in society, uh, a real cha challenge in society, is that we don't allow our young boys and men to express emotions. Mm. I think we as women uh, have a better handle on managing emotions because we are given uh, the space to do so. Yes. Um, I totally agree with this. And um, so I have four girls and I have a nephew who's like my son to me. And um, what I work on as a parent is learning how to create safe space. Learning how to create safe space mm -hmm. for <clears throat> children to be able to, you know, expose or express their emotions. Mm -hmm. um, so my daughter here. Yes. We have a practice in which um, I ask her how she's feeling. Mm -hmm. Then I say, okay, I will just be quiet. I won't say yes. anything. And you can just tell me exactly how you feel. And sometimes she doesn't always tell me. And then she takes her time <laughs> and she, then eventually she expresses how she feels. Mm -hmm. But me just shutting my mouth and not being like, well, you should do this, you should do this, you should do this. And just giving her that time to express herself. Um, then she does come around and mm -hmm. it helps me to understand my daughter better. Yes. Um, with the young man in my life, um, it's different. He... He doesn't want to express his feelings. It's a lot harder to get him to express yes. his feelings. So for us, um, it's a totally different situation. You know? Because it seems like young men, between ages of like, say, 11 to 15, <laughs> they need to get to an emotional, like where their emotions are brimming right over the top. Yeah. Or just filled with them and they don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Before they'll actually speak. And so, for me, I think um, that challenges is when you see the young man acting aggressive, mm -hmm. um, all these things. It's like, okay, what's going on with you? Mm -hmm. You know, the aggression, the not wanting to listen, these are all signals that, um, you know, they're calling for your help. Yes. And you... You know, you want to get mad and be like, listen, young man, don't don't be doing this. Don't be doing that. I told you I don't want you to do this. And you want to do all these things. Mm -hmm. But uh, the thing is, is that's the time in which it's a teachable moment and a reachable moment. Yes. That's when we can teach them something and we can reach them because mm -hmm. they're in this high state of emotion. And that's when they will be open with you. Yes. But you can't get angry. Mm -hmm. You can't be in the disciplinary mode. You have to really be like, okay, I'm going to just listen. And so um, I think many parents and many adults in general, because if we want to help the youth, we got to learn how to understand them, even yes. if we don't have kids. It's very important. We could be a teacher. Uh, we could be a, a soccer coach. Uh, we have access, not access, but we have children in our life, youths in our lives that look up to us. And we need to be able to li be able to listen when the time is right. Because mm -hmm. there might be a young man or woman who really wants to reach out to you just randomly. They're going through a lot. And you've got to know how to address that when those times come up. Especially during the Christmas season. Mm -hmm. um, I won't name names, but um, I recently spoke to a young person mm -hmm. who was telling me about another young person who's going through some traumas, you know? And um, I still, uh, I'm not sure what to really do about it just yet. And, you know, I got to do some more research and understanding and talk mm -hmm. to this other person's parents and see kind of what's going on there. Um, but I feel grateful that someone actually felt confident to share, like, hey, I think this person I just met is in danger mm -hmm. in some sort of way. Mm -hmm. um, they're emotionally feeling this certain kind of way um, and I'm just like whoa but I'm glad that I'm the kind of parent that I, you know first thing could have been like well don't hang out with that person no, don't do this don't do that blah, blah, blah. Instead, I just <laughs> that's the classic way to, uh, to prevent them from ever talking yes. to you again I just listened right mm -hmm. so. and it's important because when children come to you 
or someone comes to you with their own emotional stuff or something they are learning about or hearing about, it's mm-hmm. very important to be present and not come into place with, oh, I know what to do. You better, you know, you better do this. You better do this. Here's what um, I had a young person tell me again one day. They said, when adults hear the stuff that we have to talk about and they start being like that, to us, we, we think it's a freak out moment for the parent or for the adult. For, so when they see the freak out moment for the parents or the adult, what they decide to do is um, note to self, don't tell this person anything ever again because they mm. freak out. Because they freak out, they get hysterical, they start getting angry, they start doing this and then having a tantrum or whatever comes with it. Kids will not tell you anything. They'll keep it to themselves. And it's very important to be okay with the fact that they are choosing to come to you. Trust that and be grateful and thankful for that moment that they are coming to you. Because a child will only come to you to talk if they trust you. And when you have that fear and then lecture, they will not come to you because they wouldn't trust you. You've lost an opportunity to get into the, their world and learn and learn what it is that they're dealing with. And then figure out how am I going to reach this child and make this safe for them to come to me every time. So it's important to open up your own level of understanding and say, it's okay and I'm going to be there. And because I'm going to be there, you have to stand up for it and be open. Because if you're not open, they shut the door. They won't tell you anymore. You've lost an opportunity. And young people are struggling. Now, we have a young person in the room. Yes. So, <coughs> you can uh, I, share I your believe. Here, come on, stand up. Come sit in this chair. Or, here, you, know, you can share what you so, think. So, um, many adults, we sit around discussing what we think children need. Sometimes we've got to ask the children. Mm-hmm. So I have a question for you, my love. Yes. How can, from your perspective, how can adults better approach the youth to make them feel safe and speaking their minds and their emotions? It doesn't have to be anything crazy or inspirational, just what really comes to your mind. Speak loud. Speak up. To like, I don't know how you'd say it. Um, having like a two-way trust. Like if I tell you something, then like you you have to like tell me something. Something like that because, I don't know. But like if I tell my dad something. I like him telling me stuff, not just saying his day was good. Because, like, then it makes me feel like he trusts me as well. And then, like, and then, yeah. Okay, so let me reiterate what I'm hearing you say or what you just said. You want to be able to speak to your parents, okay, and say, Dad, Mom, this is how I'm feeling. This is what happened in my day. How was your day? Now you want to hear your parents tell you more than, oh, it was fine. It was great. You want a real conversation and say, oh, today work was tough. This thing came, I, I had a project I had, I had to get done. And then the deadline is approaching in three days. And I just found out that I haven't done 90% of the work and I'm freaking out. Right. And I'm scared and I don't know what to do, but I know that it, it, things will come up, you know, we'll work it out. We've been through these situations before and we've been able to work it. But that feeling that my gut is telling me that things might not go right. I'm a little nervous. You want to be able to hear that. You want to be able to have that conversation with your parents, right? Well, yeah, most and I don't feel it. like well, they're closing up on you. Obviously, as long as it's child appropriate and not completely like telling us every everything. Yeah. But like, just at least like if we tell.
tell you a limit of stuff you tell us the same. Like if I were to tell you about my day, mm -hmm. but then I didn't tell you about like some crazy school drama, mm -hmm. then like, I don't know. Then you can say it, but like, I don't know. Just not going so, so far, mm -hmm. but with good communication. Same, like both ways. So you want a two-way dialogue. Yes. Open communication and a dialogue that makes sense and not like feel like anything is being held from you. As long as it's appropriate. <laughs> as long as it's <laughs> appropriate. Of course, your parents will definitely make sure that what they talk about with you is child appropriate. Yeah. So that's very important. And yes, she's exactly right. Child appropriate, appropriate conversation <laughs> is needed. And in any communication, Everyone always wants a two-way conversation. They don't want to have to feel like they're talking to themselves. And just say, once again, a person's like, yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, that was good. So you had a, a pretty strange day at school, but mm-hmm. Okay, my girl. Uh, I'm going to talk about... Uh... Not child-appropriate stuff? Yeah. Well, yeah. I'll... Okay. I'll talk. Okay, I love you. Love you? <laughs> so yeah this is a very um so highly intelligent young girl who definitely by sweetie will talk to you later that gets it in terms of communication and allowing herself to express what she needs to say and i'm glad she's able to do that because not many young people feel like they're heard and she knows mm -hmm. she's going to be heard. So she's able to trust that and then express herself as honestly as she can. And I'm so glad she does that. Yes. Now, um, if we get back to like, you know, what the holiday stuff, what people might be dealing with, mm -hmm. um, I can give a real life example of what, you know, I currently went through. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, we had plans on different family members coming to visit. Yes. And, you know, with COVID, you just don't know. <laughs> you make the plans and, you know. And they fall things, through. Yeah, things fall through. <clears throat> now, in the years past when these kind of things would happen, mm -hmm. uh, I had a myriad of emotions mm -hmm. and thoughts. So one of them was, oh, well, I guess I'm not import important to this particular person. That they can't come see me. Mm -hmm. Oh, another one was, what did I ever do wrong to them? Oh, maybe they're still holding a grudge from when we were five years old. And I threw sand in his face. <laughs> uh, you know, or her face. Mm -hmm. uh, all these different things. And so this year, I um, had some plans fall through. And... Instead of going down the same path as before, thinking that it's a personal attack, yes. thinking that people don't care about me, mm -hmm. I said to myself, I don't know what the reason is, but they're not coming, and I, they have their personal reasons why they're not coming, yes. and it's not up to me to absorb that and to say that, you know, poor me, to mm -hmm. be the victim. Mm -hmm. I just said, like, I don't have control over other people's lives. Yeah. And the decisions that they make. And I can't assume that the decision they made was a direct attack on my, on me. Mm -hmm. Or was directly um, done to hurt me because they didn't realize how they hurt me. Yeah. Um, so these kind of things, uh, having this emotional intelligence and understanding of yourself mm -hmm. is very important. Because we often look at the actions of other people and we either A, think that those actions are direct attack on us, mm -hmm. especially if it's someone close to you. <clears throat> and then we also think like, oh, um, I'm just a poor victim. Like, everybody does this to me or whatever. You know, you go through those different uh, stages. And as a therapist, because mm -hmm. like, I know how I, I've handled it, but uh, I'd like my sister's opinion, like, you know, from the therapy perspective, on like how those things might be handled. Well, there's a couple of things that may be handled if I have your permission to dig. Uh, sure. 
<laughs> I'll, I'll go easy on you. <laughs> Here's the thing. When you're feeling or taking these things personal, that comes from a deeper place, from a learned behavior from trauma. Yes. yes. From many years of feeling like your needs are not being met. Yes. So then you're, it's the, the reason why that emotion keeps coming up or when people say no to to you saying, oh, I want you to come for the holidays. And then they say no, you immediately go to rejection. Hmm. And rejection I, of I, me and saying I'm not that, sure I go to rejection. Mm-hmm. Um, it's an expectation. Okay, so you built up an expectation yes. on your own that was not fulfilled. So then you run to... All these things and say, oh, because I did this, so it's a personal, you take it personal. Yeah, that's the mm-hmm. standard programming mm-hmm. that, you know, it's a learned behavior that everybody learns. Mm-hmm. Not everybody, everyone has different programs that they Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you're not aware mm-hmm. of the programming that's taking place within mm-hmm. yourself, mm-hmm. then you don't even realize that this program is playing out. Yes. And so one of the programs that I was taught Mm -hmm. uh, through my lifetime was Mm -hmm. when you're good to people and they're not good back to you, Mm -hmm. that it's a personal attack, Mm. you know? Wow. And because you expect, and this is a program once again, Mm -hmm. you expect that people will treat you the way you treat them. Mm -hmm. You know, as as kids, we were told, like, you know, treat others the way you want to be treated. Yeah. I kind of think that's some bullshit because you have an expectation, you know, maybe when people are teaching kids this stuff, they should go a little bit deeper into that. Yes. Um, Because when you're just left with that one sentence, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it becomes, um, what is it? Expectations. You're like, well, Mm -hmm. I was good to, you know, Jack, Jill, and Bob. So (laughs) Jack, Jill, and Bob should be good to me. (laughs) Yes. There's an expectation there. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because um, I'm glad you use that line treat people the way they, they should treat you. We have now found out that that's a myth and it's not true. Okay? Because we have an expectation that the way we treat people, we should have, that's how we want to be treated. We are telling them based on how we are treating them is how we want to be treated. But we are not guaranteed that that individual who yes. is receiving that treatment is the one who is going to treat you that way. Mm. Number one, we, don't, we tell ourselves or we were taught that when you're honest, be honest to people and they'll be honest with you. That's a myth too. Mm. It does not happen because the honesty is you showing your own integrity. It's you showing to the world who I am and I'm okay being upstanding and being truthful, being the person that I am. Now, what is going to happen in individuals who also operate in that level of thinking? When they come near you, they resonate with that. They recognize that. So they stand up for that. But then we are not taught that as children when we're growing up. Mm -hmm. So now, when someone that you know is receiving or you're telling them something about you or about your own situation, what happens is they begin to recognize that, hey, maybe I don't have time to come and see you because I have other things to do. Mm -hmm. And it has nothing to do with you being, say, uh, them saying, you're not important to me. They might see that, hmm, Right now, I cannot afford to be where you need me right now. I cannot afford to be there because the conditions are not conducive to what I need. But the strangest thing is they don't speak to you about that. They don't tell you that, hey, I wish I could come. I really would like to come. But here's the thing. I'll have to take this time off. I'll have to lose this paycheck. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And a a myriad of things. And it is their own personal reasons. Then you, the individual who is receiving that, I can't believe I'm not that important to them. Then it's time to access the fact that, okay, who is more important to you right now? 
It's you, your children, your family right now. So if anything that comes up that you cannot accommodate, would you forgo that and say, I want to go in, do what the other person wants me to do? The moment yeah, you begin that. to see that, that makes you kind of flip it over to the other. And then it allows you to quell down that emotion of that feeling, oh, I'm not on their priority list. You see how that changes? Because everybody has their own priority list. Yes. But when something comes up and then it's like, oh, it's a little off my priority list. So I'm not going to be able to fulfill what somebody needs me. Then it becomes easier for you to handle that. Yeah. And I, then I feel also it. like um, it's the same when, when you do things. Mm-hmm. So you have a friend that's reached out to you or sent you a message. And you haven't responded like, oh, I'm having a rough day. Maybe you didn't see the message. Mm -hmm. Maybe you've had a long day. Yes. Um, You know, and the thing is, is like, they may be feeling the same way. Yes. You're my best friend and I just reached out to you and obviously you don't care. Yeah. Not knowing what's going on in your life. Exactly. What your priorities are. (laughs) Yeah. You know, you could be literally in the middle of like, uh, you know, cooking dinner for a family of 10. Yeah. And the family's thinking, you know, and this person's thinking like, oh, you, you don't respect me. You don't love yeah. me. You don't care about me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I really like the advice. It, it does help to understand like, you know, um, that the expectation is kind of what disappoints you in the first place. Yes. And it sets also, you off for that. Yeah. And also just having ignorance. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. we make assumptions. We mm-hmm. say, okay. I assume this person is doing this because of this. Yes. That's an assumption. Yes. We don't have any evidence to support that assumption. Yes. But it's the dialogue you're having in your head. Yes. And then... And then there's also, you know, just like, I expect that you will treat me like this because we are friends. Or mm-hmm. um, I, I lent you uh, $500 last week and you should answer my phone. <laughs> yeah. You know? <laughs> yes. The expectations. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and it takes a lot of, like, emotional regulation and self-control. Yes. And I always say this, understanding yourself. Yeah, it's very important. Because then when you start to understand yourself, you can see what you're contributing to, like, how you're reacting mm-hmm. when you understand yourself. Mm-hmm. And this helps you to, like, navigate through all the, the BS and come up with, like, the, the truth yes. of how you're feeling. Yes. And that's very important because when you, you begin to navigate your emotional, um, for lack of a better word, battleground. <laughs> the emotional battleground. When you're navigating that, remind yourself, it is not about me at this moment. It's what I am thinking and hoping for. And expecting but if that expectation and the hope and the thinking is not honored it is nothing personal to me yeah it is nothing personal to me taking everything personal yes and it's okay it's okay because it is what it is and the other good thing about this is you begin to recognize that your the battle you thought you were in, the battleground you thought you were, your emotional battleground, it's not as volatile as you thought. Because when you recognize it, it's not personal. And it's not about me. And I always say, be okay accepting people where they are with what they're willing to give in the relationship. And once you recognize that, accept it. Because you cannot change it to fit the way you want it to to fit. Because the moment you begin to believe that you can change it to fit what it is that you want to see in your head, guess what you've created? You've created an environment of manipulation. And that never works. That's real. Anything that you feel you must manipulate... To suit 
your expectations and your way of thinking, you have lost yourself. And that is manipulation. And manipulation never works. Yes, I agree. Uh, once you learn that you can't control Anyone. other people's actions, you can manipulate somebody's actions. You can manipulate a response out of someone. But, you know, that's a short-term control. It mm-hmm. doesn't actually do anything for you. No, it doesn't work. Um, you know, and once you let go of the understanding that you have no control over that person's mm-hmm. reactions and emotions. Yeah. You know, then you free yourself from their yes. bullshit. Yes. Yeah. Because and then when you free yourself, yeah. there's something. I don't know if you ever experienced this. When you begin to recognize this and realize that I cannot control any of that except control myself. Yes. The way we react. And then my reaction or your reaction to an event, to a situation. Do you ever feel, I know I, that happened to me when I, that aha moment came, I realized I was more relaxed. I didn't feel nervous or anxious mm. about trying to get a response, trying to get anything. It was just like, okay, it is what it is. Well, essentially, when you feel the need to get control mm-hmm. of somebody else, you know, when this feeling comes, this predictive programming. It comes to you and you're like, okay, uh, that person said something fucked up to me and I want to know why. I don't want to make assumptions, but I want to know why I don't want to know what the fucking truth is. Mm-hmm. And so you start to obsess. You're like, okay, well, I'm going to fucking press you until you tell me the truth. <laughs> you have no control over that person. You can ask them why they said that shit. Mm-hmm. And they can make up anything. Mm -hmm. They can make up 50 different things, but besides the truth of why they said something. Yes. And here you are, you're like, I know that's a lie, I know that's a lie. And you're just fucking falling down the fucking pit. Mm -hmm. And um, once you realize, you know what? That person said something fucked up. That's on them. Only they know why they said that shit. Mm -hmm. Only they know why they felt the need to spew some hate on you today. Mm Mm-hmm. It's not your business. Yes. Doesn't it, mean you have to take it, though. No. Doesn't mean you have to be like, oh, you know, please, uh, you know, the other cheek. It's like, I, you know, I don't believe in that. I think you need to stand up for yourself. Mm-hmm. But when you start to obsess on why they would hurt you, it's not your business. Mm-hmm. Only they know why they want to hurt you. Yes. Only they know why they want to spew some toxic shit at you. Mm-hmm. And many people go through this during the holiday season. Mm-hmm. Because you'll see people that are, <clears throat> sorry, you'll see people that are suffering in mm-hmm. their own life. Mm-hmm. And then they come out to events, or they come to see family, or they go out to a party, and they just want to be a dick to everybody. Yeah. It's because they're struggling inside themselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so they want to come out and just like spew toxic shit onto other people. Mm-hmm. And here you are, that person spewed something on you. And you've decided, you know what? Instead of defending myself, I'm going to be offensive. I'm going to give you back what you fed me. Mm-hmm. So now someone says some ignorant ass shit to you. You go up and you're like, you know what? You say something even more worse. Mm-hmm. Deep. Mm-hmm. Maybe it turns into a fist fight, which is horrible. Mm-hmm. But most times, if you're a decent human being, even if they said something fucked up to you, you turn around and you feel guilty because you're a good person. They fed you negativity and rage and you mm-hmm. fed it right back to them. Mm-hmm. And now you feel bad. So the fact that you gave in. Mm-hmm. So you, once you lost control of yourself, mm-hmm. you allowed yourself to be vulnerable in a way in which you lost control of your emotions. That's my opinion anyways. I'm yeah. not a therapist. Well, that's Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, to piggyback off of what you're saying, when you, you're you dealing with your loved ones, friends, even friends at a party, it still happens. When you're dealing with this and then the person is spewed because they're feeling all this angst and emotions or remembering their love, 
their loved ones or those who they can't be with or those they wish they could be with, especially with this COVID, those that they wish they could be with and they're not, they not accessible to them. They're not there for them to see. And they're feeling all these emotions. Remember I was saying that you, you first need to ask yourself where this emotion is coming from because mm. what has happened is language, access to language has decreased. Because access to language has decreased, you're not able to access that. You're not able to tell what is happening. You start spewing out. When you spew out, you will say a lot of hurtful things to your loved ones or those who are around you that didn't hurt you or didn't bring the emotion up. You will hurt them with hurtful words. Now, the person on the receiving end of this hurtful words, here's what to do. It is okay not to engage. Number one. Number two, recognize that this individual is spewing this not because of anything you did. Mm. It's a feeling on the inside. So how is it possible that you or the other person will be believing that an external force will be able to change what is on the inside? Think about it. The person is feeling this in their head, in their heart, and then getting more angry and then getting more obsessive about something and spewing hate and anger and, and all this. If you engage, number two, what number three, what you're doing is you are joining that person at the level that they are in that toxic moment. You are cho- choosing to join them in that low point. So, Honestly, when you join someone at that low point, you are literally saying that your level of understanding and thinking is as little as that person is bringing. And you lose your own credibility. And there's nothing more deserving to this honest to yourself than to... Choose something that does not serve your soul. Because you are now choosing to go lower. And access into an emotion that is not yours. People will bring their toxic to you. But be mindful of what that is doing to them. And then choose not to join. I'm not saying you don't care about them. You still do. And you care about them. You love them. And you want to help them. But the best way to help them is to stand calm. Know your center. I always keep saying know your center. Meaning what you need to do for you to maintain your peace. What you need to do to maintain your personal space within you. Do so. And when this person is bringing that, recognize it and call it for what it is. This is what they're dealing with right now. But I choose not to let that affect me. Because guess what? You can look this up. Mirroring is real. You can mirror somebody's response to you. You can mirror somebody's emotion by matching them. And when you match them, honestly, you have lost yourself. And when you lose yourself, you have no access to bringing yourself to where you were to begin with. So recognize it, pull yourself back and say, this is where uh, the, the person is. I remember when I was going to grad school, my professor told me this. I used to tell him that, oh, I just, I feel like I absorb everything the person is feeling. And I just want to help so much. I just want to do so much. And he's like, whoa, slow your road. So you want to join. So what are you doing? And he he painted this picture for me. He said, imagine you have a body of water and a person is in it and is rushing. But when you the person comes to you, there's something they need, but you don't even know what it is until the person speaks to you. So he said, why don't you just dip one foot in that water? And keep the other foot on dry dry ground. Because the other foot that is on dry ground is your sanity, your center, 
and your own understanding. That will never change. Keep your dry ground. Stay there. Dip the one foot in there to join their processing to be able to feel what is going on. And you can take the other foot out again. Both on dry ground. And now that you understand and know what is what they're feeling and you can feel something about it, now you can speak to that. Speak to it and say, huh, when I put my foot in the water, it felt cold, it felt distant, it felt um, scary, it's rushing, I have no control, I have this. That's what they are, the person is feeling. Mm. Now speak to that. That gives you clarity. That gives you something powerful to work with the person. The person now begins to feel, wow, you really get me. Wow, you really understand what's going on with me. Okay. So even though I'm feeling this and I'm feeling alone, but I feel like you're kind of here holding my hand through it. I'm not saying you will solve my problem, but you're not leaving me alone. This is what happens. But then you see how if you jump in with both feet in the water, both of you are rushing out of the water and you don't know where it's going to go. You might both drown. Somebody needs to keep their feet on dry ground. Do that. And then speak to the person and begin to connect. And guess what? What happens is because you're on dry ground, you can see the whole picture. And now you can come up with maybe some solutions. But that doesn't mean the person will take your solutions. But you may have some suggestions and say, I get this. This is how you're feeling. And this and, and the person, oh, wow, you, you get me. Okay, you're feeling. Okay, wow, this is happening. And then you begin to put yourself in a process of understanding how best to deal with this. And there's nothing better than recognizing where the person is coming from, and then the peace can be maintained. So in the holidays, when you're having all that, somebody needs to be clear. Somebody needs to be present and grow with you so that you can both get a healthy outcome and enjoy the holiday without waiting till the the holiday ends and then you two hate each other. (laughs) <laughs> and then, because you've thrown really wild bombs at each other. And that could be relatives. The stuff that you were nervous about before coming to the holiday party or the family gathering, now you've got more load to take with you. Next year it's going to come up. By the time you know, you've got a mountain of loads and you're getting ready to get drowned in them. Mm-hmm. Now, um, what do I want to talk about now? Forgot. No, I didn't forget. Okay, good. I'm just trying to see like uh, how appropriate it is for Facebook Live. <laughs> well, you have to be clean now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Uh, hmm. Managing your own emotional bubble. Mm-hmm. Now, this is something I've learned. Mm-hmm. And it's a really, really important tool. Mm-hmm. So... Um, what I learned, uh, I think it was about two years ago, is one of the first things I learned uh, about psychology mm-hmm. um, was, okay, so you have this bubble. Mm-hmm. This is your bubble. Mm-hmm. You know, within there is your environment, mm-hmm. your emotional environment, how you feel, what's going on in your life, mm-hmm. um, how you're feeling physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. All of that within this bubble. Mm-hmm. Now, you've done all your own work, you've done your healing, you've done all these things. You go to visit a friend. They're going through a really, really hard time in life. Maybe they're feeling like suicidal, maybe they're feeling extremely depressed, uh, they're extremely addicted to drugs and alcohol. And you've done a lot of work to pull yourself out of that kind of mindset and maybe out of that kind of addiction. So... What happens is, while you're sitting there talking with them, they start talking about things that have that are currently going on in their life that are triggers for you and your 
before, so mm-hmm. your youth. Mm-hmm. So you've done your healing. You've worked through all of your traumas. You've done all these things. And then they start talking about something that's currently happening in their life, mm-hmm. something that may have happened to you when mm-hmm. you were like 15 or whatever. Mm-hmm. Then you start feeling anxiety. Then you start feeling depressed. Mm-hmm. And holy shit, all of a sudden you're feeling exactly like this person you came to help. Oh. Now it's not their fault. Because they're just feeling really emotional mm-hmm. and they're just they're just you know, looking for a, a lifeboat, you know, looking for someone to help them so mm-hmm. they don't drown. And you've come in and you don't have the tools yet. You don't mm-hmm. understand that you gotta protect your bubble. Yes. So now you come in. Now you're depressed like them. <laughs> And maybe you decide, hey, man, pass that joint or pass that beer. I'm feeling sad now, too, bro. Let's <laughs> let's just do this, you know? And a day later, both of you are depressed and sad mm-hmm. and addicted, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And um, the thing is, what we got to understand is when we get to a place where we're healing and mm-hmm. we've got some tools, mm-hmm. we really got to use those tools. Yes. And so one thing you can do is what I was taught anyways. Is you picture it as two bubbles, right? Mm -hmm. So their environment, they're going through some serious trauma, some depression, some sadness, whatever it is. They're going through it. It exists. But that's not the reality that is going on within your environment. Mm -hmm. And so you don't want your bubble to get so close to theirs that it ends up merging. Because that's when things go wrong. What I was taught to do, you throw a couple lines. You know, <clears throat> you're throwing compassion. You're having compassion for their situation. Mm-hmm. Then you throw a line of empathy. You're like feeling like, whoa, that must be it's a horrible way to feel. Mm-hmm. And I empathize for you. And you're throwing caring, right? You're throwing these lines to them. But you're not allowing yourself to use these lines as a way to pull each other to pull each other together, you know, so that you're all of a sudden your bubbles unite. So, what you can do is remind yourself mm-hmm. as you're talking to them, mm-hmm. and you start to feel those emotions creeping in. Mm-hmm. You say to yourself, I am not in that environment. Mm-hmm. What is happening to them is horrible. Mm-hmm. I feel bad for them. I simply, I, I, I have compassion for them. Mm-hmm. I have empathy for them. And what's going on in their environment is not right. But it's yes. not your current environment. You are not sitting in their shoes, mm-hmm. wearing their clothes, going through the exact same thing. Yeah. And that's how you got to protect your emotions. Mm-hmm. And you'll be strong enough to help this person when you do that. So... And that's exactly how I was telling, talking to you about. Dip your foot in the water so you can feel this and understand what is going on. <laughs> or at least learn a little bit of what is going on. Yeah. And then stay. So it's the same way. Learning to protect your bubbles is being on dry ground and don't mm. get into the water too deep and it get drunk yeah, and then nice join yeah. into Because caring about someone yeah. It's not about joining. It's about understanding the process, joining the process with just your foot in the water to just yes. understand enough to now, process. I think the next line, we should talk about the drama triangle, if you're okay with that. We can talk about that. Uh, but <clears throat> thank you very much for everyone who watched. Yes. Um, my sister... Uh, you can be found on Shoda Eglagu Abba. Yes. Uh, and Facebook also, Live. Uh, yeah. And if you're ever looking for therapy, you can reach out to her. Yes. And I do a podcast called Love, Forgive, Live. Yo, you got to really watch that. <laughs> Love, Forgive, Live. It's on YouTube. It's on Spotify. It's on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, iHeartRadio, on Twitter. Um, I believe there's a page for the Facebook and is love, forgive, live. 
and you can go on there. I do. I used to do a live. I haven't done one for in a while because things have just become so busy. But uh, I have several live shows that I've done, which is a recording of shows that I used to do every Tuesday. But you can also the recording is there. You can always go to Love Forgive Live and listen to it, watch it, and of course go to the. Spotify and of course you can go to YouTube and listen to Love Forgive Live podcast. This is the second year we're going into our third year of doing that podcast. So it's something that I'm very passionate about um bringing knowledge, wisdom and of course message about healing, empowering and of course um encouraging and motivating one another about our own mental health. Yes. Thank you very much for joining me on Love Forgive Live and thank you brother for <laughs> doing this podcast with me and Nayana thank you so much. I love you both very much and uh we will probably do one on trauma trials and the dramas that comes through trauma. Yeah. Thank you very much and uh have an amazing week. Happy holidays everyone out there. Enjoy your meal and take a little time to just love on one another because right now is all we have. We don't have yesterday. We don't have tomorrow yes. yet. This moment is the best time right now. Enjoy, be joyful, have peace. Love you all. Oh, those who want to email me or ask questions and ideas that you think I should address, topics you want me to address, go to love, L-U-V, the number four, give, G-I-V-E, at, sorry, G-I-V-E, live, L-I-V-E. So love, the number four, L-U-V, the number four, give, live, at gmail.com and you can reach me at um, that email and then I'll be able to email you back address any questions that you want me to address and let you know when I'll be able to address this on a, uh, the next topic okay love you all bye bye yes we love you ciao